Okay, let's get started. So it's my honor and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, Dr. William Herrick is a professor emeritus of philosophy right down the road here from Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville. Uh, he earned his doctorate in philosophy from Vanderbilt University. And this is a sort of role model to me is that uh, after that you also earned a second doctorate as well later on. So uh, a couple years later, going to the uh, Institute of Philosophy at uh, Lubin, um, it, uh, more recently to, for a second doctorate. So his most recent publications are Nature and Logos, A, Wh a White Hedian Key to Merleau-Ponty's Fundamental Thought, and Rereading Merleau-Ponty's uh, Reading Montaigne in Chiasma International. Uh, he is currently finishing a book-length manuscript on the implications of Merleau-Ponty's fundamental thought for understanding the phenomenon of shame. And it is my privilege to introduce Bill. And uh, just to let you know, he's going to present his, his talk, and then we'll take like a five-minute break. So once he's so for people to kind of gather their thoughts, and then we'll do a Q and A after that sort of five-minute break. So without any further ado, please welcome Bill Hart. Thank you. I'd like to begin by thanking the uh, conference organizers for the honor of uh, sharing my reflections with you. Um, I don't have a title for my book yet, actually, on shame, so if you have some suggestions, I would like to have them. Uh, this subtitle, I think, is going to be Heraclitus' famous statement, Being loves to hide. Okay. Uh, secondly, uh, you will hear in this paper uh, several traces of papers you've already heard uh, yesterday, and especially today, and most especially Professor Dreyer's paper uh, this afternoon. Okay. So, shame, the amorphous phenomenon. Philosophers in the Western tradition, at least since Plato, have interpreted intelligibility in terms of form, morphe. In turn, they have sought that intelligibility in definitions. What is X, question mark, became the primary approach to understanding. Three main forms of definitions emerge. An ostensive definition takes a paradigm case, um, but tells you very little about other types or less central examples. The second and most common type of definition consists of setting boundaries. And this is what you see in every beginning logic book. You want to construct a definition that is wide enough to include all cases of X, but not too broad so as to include cases of not X. Third, we can define it by centers, that is by identifying core properties that should anything possess them, uh, that would be X. This method is most congenial to Husserl's eidetic uh, phenomenology, since he sought not empirical generalizations, uh, but rather attributes that are necessary to constitute the phenomenon at issue. The case of shame, section one. How should we define it? It's been a subject of perennial interest in the West ever since the Greeks, and longer than that in China. The result has been a great variety of concepts of shame and not just one concept with many different instantiations. For the Greeks, uh, shame consisted of humiliation that could be inflicted by the gods. See Prometheus or Ajax. In the Middle Ages, shame was indelibly a part of the sinful human condition, whereas in the Renaissance, the stress on individuality and self-development overturned the medieval view. And as Dan Zahavi points out, um, for those of you not in philosophy, it's Z-A-H-A-V-I. Um, Chinese, he wrote, is supposed to contain 113 shame-related terms, and has, for instance, special terms for losing face, truly losing face, losing face terribly, being ashamed to death, being so ashamed that even the ancestors of eight generations can feel it. There's no hint, of the way, by the way, of what you have to do to gain that last uh, dubious distinction. There's also the Maori concept of wakama, 
that references a wide range of experience and feelings that um, are considered quite separate in Western uh, languages, such as shy, embarrassed, uncertain, inadequate, incapable, afraid, hurt in an emotional sense, depressed, or ashamed. None of the three traditional types of definitions succeeds well with shame. Offering ostensive definitions and defining by boundaries in the face of such rich historical uh, diversity and culturally variable concepts is almost impossible. Identifying core properties, even supplemented by ostensive definitions, is better suited to the task. But their major problem is that the definitions express the genus but not the species. That is, not the specific difference or differences that sets shame apart from kindred phenomena, as well as what looks like radically different kinds of shame. Furthermore, some of the descriptions apply to experiences that have nothing whatsoever to do with shame. Um, Martha Nussbaum, whose name may be meaningful to uh, some of you, <coughs> Nussbaum uh, defined shame as the I'm not remembering, remembering correctly the exact word, but she meant the unwanted exposure of some um, abnormal, she put that in quotes, I don't know, deficiency or defect or some such. Um, well, that could characterize some experiences of shame, but not all. Um, for example, or even experiences that aren't shameful. If my medical records uh, became uh, public knowledge um, and the surgeries I've had, the heart attacks, etc., cetera, um, I would be embarrassed. I might even be angry, but I don't think I'd feel ashamed. Tompkins, Sylvan Tompkins, whose name may also be familiar to you, he defined shame painful affect resulting from any interruption of pleasure or expectation. That's much too broad. It covers all kinds of things that are a matter of shame. Um, if I have practiced very hard for a game um, and, and I lose it, it does cause a painful affect resulting from any interruption of pleasure and expectation. But that's not enough itself to create a feeling of shame. Not being hired for a job that I have applied for can produce a feeling of shame, uh, but certainly it might produce a painful outfit, but it won't produce any shame if I find out that the university has managed to hire the acknowledged expert in the field. So Tompkins' definition is also much too broad. There's also the problem of the enormous complexity of shame. Anthony Steinbach um, states, shame is a complex moral emotion, and it's impossible in the scope of a chapter to treat every dimension of it. That's from his book, um, Moral Emotions Reclaiming the Evidence of the Heart. Um, this is also true for entire books, even in specialized contexts. For instance, after 224 pages, even Fermi, F-E-R-N-I-E, most of these, his conclusion to shame in Shakespeare admits, another embarrassment in writing this book has been the impossible to convey richness of shame itself, end quote. But given this richness and complexity, it appears that the closest we can come to an adequate definition of shame is something like Wittgenstein's notion of family resemblances. Familia Englishkeiten. And it's not clear to me how one can do a phenomenology of shame, trying to reach some kind of essential meaning, uh, simply on the basis of family resemblances. That's why I think of shame as an amorphous phenomenon. Um, in, in discussion later, I would love to have a solution to that problem, how I could get at the essential meaning or meanings of shame based on uh, family resemblances. Nonetheless, we do know certain things about shame, even if short of an adequate definition. Uh, so in my book, I take up diverse modes of it involved in failures due to culpable ignorance, lack of 
practical wisdom, of self-control, shame by association, and body shame. In this paper, I'm going to concentrate on shame by association because of its relevance to Alfred Schutz, whose work is of interest to many in this society. First though, what do we know about shame? The phenomena show that shame exists as both a state of being, as the medievals noted, or can exist as a state of being, and as a painful emotion that no sane person would will. As a state of being, contemporary American politics display such a state in a variety of ways. And, and here I have to struggle against myself to limit the list because of our time factor here. Um, consider the bizarre perpetuation of what's called the big lie. You know, election denialism is such that right now more than 100 Republican members of the U.S. House of Representatives are on record as denying the legitimacy of the 2020 uh, presidential election. Um, how much of this is sincere and how much consists of pandering to the rabid base is unclear, but if it's the latter, uh, their behavior is shameful for a different reason. There's also the acquiescence to and encouragement of a destructive gun culture. Uh, the United States now apparently has more guns than people, and according to The Guardian, at least 100 and, um, uh, at least 150 million guns have been sold in this country uh, since the Sandy Hook School Massacre in 2012, and that's beside the um, untold numbers of what are called ghost guns for our foreign uh, guests. Those are guns you make yourself for fun and profit um, with parts that you can buy legally off the internet. They're untraceable. Then of course there's the horrible abuse of migrants and refugees in our southern border and earlier in Syria. There's the abandonment of facts, reason, and truth manifested in appalling credulity and alternate facts. The absence of civility, the lack of respect for differences, especially toward LGBTQ people. Um, armed violence, the sharp rise of anti-Semitism and other right-wing violence, etc. There's likewise a destructive corporate greed, from Bernie Madoff to cryptocurrency and the resulting phenomenal wealth imbalance, uh, not only within this country, but throughout the world. We also know that shame as an objective fact is parasitic on the experience of shame. No one could experience shame, nobody, excuse me, no one could experience shame. No one would be able to describe a certain situation as shameful. As for the experience itself, the central case consists of the subject feeling shame and derivatively feeling shame for another. Feeling shame oneself is a highly personal intercorporeal experience that cannot be self-manufactured. This is why Seneca wrote in his epistle 11, the Roman players hang down their heads, fix their eyes on the ground, and keep them lowered, but are unable to blush in acting shame." Unquote. Um, that's quoted by uh, Charles Darwin in The Expression of Emotions in Animals. We also know that shame and embarrassment are closely related there's considerable disagreement among psychologists and philosophers uh, about uh, how they are related, what the differences are between them. Uh, some consider all cases of shame to be cases of embarrassment, but not the other way around, uh, such that shame differs from embarrassment by degree rather than kind. Other thinkers, such as Steinbach and uh, Gabriel Taylor, hold that uh, shame and embarrassment are uh, distinct. So, if you want to come back to that discussion uh, later, um, that's fine. I mean, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip it. Um, if we dig deeper, um, if we ask why uh, the experience of shame is seen as more shattering or more heavy or serious than experiences of mere embarrassment, um, we discovered that that's not actually a good reason for thinking that, that thinking of them distinct in kind. And the, the, the 
uh, the reason is that <clears throat> it's easier for um, consciousness to be subtly at work in shielding our self-esteem uh, in embarrassment, embarrassment rather than feelings of shame. As uh, Jean-Paul Sartre pointed out, man, um, love, is a totality and not a collection. Consequently, he expresses himself as a whole in even his most insignificant and superficial behavior. In other words, there is not a taste, a mannerism, or a human act which is not revealing. Therefore, even embarrassment, even in embarrassment, the whole self is revealed because of the unity and consciousness of being implied in any given action. So even a minor faux pas reveals me as a kind of person, clumsy enough, for example, um, to make an embarrassing mistake. It does not usually have our same weight in a, in a person, the same weight in our self-consciousness because it's easier to repress. As Nietzsche wrote in Beyond Good and Evil, I have done that, says my memory. I cannot have done that, says my pride, and remains inexorable. Eventually, memory yields. In Sartrean terms, what pride does is make us think of ourselves as a collection rather than in totality, and that we can mentally discard inconvenient pieces and leave the rest of the whole intact. Um, there's a related argument to show that shame cannot be neatly cleaved from embarrassment. It consists of a variation on Bernard Williams' notion of moral luck. Um, suppose that Sorry, the clumsiness. I tried to um, print these uh, without co-ing, but my printer has a mind of its own, and he insisted on printing back to back, so I could get out of it. Um, so here's the experiment. Suppose that I'm driving, um, and I get behind, behind some old fossil, you know, like me, and he's going really slowly, and I run out of patience. I'm desperate for time. So I edge out, without looking for oncoming traffic to pass quickly. Now, scenario A, uh, no one's coming, and I get away with it. So I will lightly chastise myself and, and resolve to do better in the future, and so on. Uh, but it lies on my conscience like a feather. Scenario B, somebody is coming, and very closely, and nearly hits me and I can tell from the horns blaring and the driver glaring at me and the screaming of my passengers uh, that this is not so easily dismissed. So I will have um, an experience of shame rather than mere embarrassment, um, though I should have had the same feeling with scenario A as well. It just happened to have the luck uh, that I got away with it in scenario A. There's a related dispute um, that I think many of you are probably familiar with, and it's the issue of whether emotions are cognitive or non-cognitive. And this has to do with, uh, oh, uh, sorry, it's relevant to a paper we heard um, this afternoon. I'm sorry, a lot of these papers are blurring into each other at this moment. I can't remember the exact title. Was the one just before romantic love. Um, Unless it's gross. Meaning adequacy. Anyway, um, whether emotions are cognitive or non cognitive. Um, Ruth Lays, L U I S, in her book uh, From Guilt to Shame, Auschwitz and After notes that most philosophers hold that emotions are cognitive, uh, while most psychologists take them to be non-cognitive, uh, blind affects or explosions of power. Lay's sides with the philosophers, as do I, for the following three reasons. Shame is guided by interpretation that generates perceptual acts, and as James Minch uh, points out, there is a correlation between the interpretative intention that animates the scene and the disclosive behavior that it guides, unquote. 
Similarly, Max Scheler observes that in vital feelings, he calls them, we feel our life itself and we are given the peculiar value content of our environment. Uh, for example, the freshness of the forest, the living power of growing trees, as well as fellow feeling that can contribute to the foundation of a consciousness of community. He goes on to say that with respect to vital feelings such as anxiety, disgust, shame, appetite, aversion, vital sympathy, and vital aversion, the entire sense and meaning of these feelings uh, consist in the fact that they point to the value of what is coming, not to the value of what is present, end quote. And in addition, in uh, connection with the foundation of community, shame usually embodies an implicit positive valuation of others. If I were completely indifferent to the welfare of others, or say, my country, I would not care if I caused them harm in propagating lies about stolen election, QAnon delusions, um, Jewish space lasers, etc. But if I do care, I will feel ashamed. Third, and closely connected with the previous mode of valuation, as Aristotle saw, Shame implies an implicit valuation of others' opinions of oneself. Okay. Section two, linguistic precision. Thus far, I've been discussing only one sense of shame, and English encourages that because it has only the one word for what other languages distinguish. Even putting aside the extreme Maori and Chinese uh, largesse, uh, Latin offers two words that refer to distinct phenomena. Ignominia designates the sense of shame that I've been discussing, the sense of which you feel shame. Its French equivalent, la honte, H-O-N-T-E, sorry, it's la honte. German also has only the one word, uh, die Scham, but it provides several helpful cognates that clarify the second sense of shame. That sense encompasses what English renders as modesty, chastity, prudence, a sense of honor, decency, discretion, self-control, and so on. For the Greeks, as Bernard Williams uh, explains, the word aidoia, A-I-D-O-I-A, -A, uh, a derivative of aidos, A-I-D-O-S, shame, is a standard Greek word for the genitals, and similar terms are found in other languages. Eidos was always accompanied by righteous indignation, the name of the goddess being Nemesis. The two are shared sentiments with similar objects, and they serve to bind people together in a community of feeling, Williams adds. The Latin word for the second sense of shame, uh, rendered as modesty, etc., is uh, pudor, P-U-D-O-R. The French is la pudeur, P-U-D-E-U-R. And although the German is still sham, its helpful cognates are die Genugsamkeit, simple needs, undemandingness, in Anspruchlosigkeit, modesty, unpretentiousness, Basigkeit, um, moderation, restraint, especially in terms of eating and drinking. Uh, to our German guests, I hope that that is correct. Um, I got these out of my very thick German dictionary. It's accurate. In regard to the latter, <coughs> uh, eating, eating and drinking, John Russon, R-U-S-S-O-N, has pointed out how our self-identity is deeply embedded in our eating practices. The notion of shame as pudor is embedded in these practices, and German captures it by distinguishing between eating, essen, and feeding, fressen, think animal house. In this context, such, uh, Shame as abshad, disgust, is closely linked to the experience of uncleanliness as well as to the excess of gluttony. Similarly, Shaler appeals to shame in both senses to preserve the spiritual side of our nature from sinking purely into purely animal life, though with particular concern for sex rather than eating. Still, there are powerful relationships between food and sex, or if you prefer love making, and perhaps that's why um, Chocolates are always a staple of Valentine's Day. Yet it's hardly, it's hardly a new concern even 
in Shaler's lifetime. You can find the same concerns in ancient texts as well, one of which being um, Sallust's The War with Catiline. That's a good example. Pudor establishes guardrails for what used to be called civility, civilized behavior, respect for differences, etc. It presupposes self-restraint and the avoidance of transgressions of boundaries. cultural diagnosis of, I think that one of the major problems of our society today, in this country at least, is that we have lost a sense of shame in that regard, um, that shamelessness is a widespread cultural phenomenon. Such transgressions can occur both negatively in failing and falling into disgrace and positively in terms of inappropriately reaching too high. The Greek example for the latter was Prometheus. Tudor was very early on gendered in terms of chastity for women, and still is in some parts of the world, where premarital sex uh, constitutes disgrace for the girl and her family, and or the death of the girl herself. Thus, shame was used as a tool of coercion in maintaining and strengthening uh, sexual mores. Montaigne, who bitterly criticized those controls, stated in his essays, let us confess the truth. There's hardly one of us, men, who would not rather be a thief and sacrilegious and have his wife be a murderess and a heretic than not to have her be more chaste than her husband." End quote. Shakespeare expressed the same type of collective pressure in Much Ado About Nothing, uh, in which Hero, the intended bride, is falsely accused of unchastity. The accusation alone shames both her and her family. Alexander McCall Smith put it, <clears throat> women as usual were expected to behave better than men and inevitably attracted criticism for doing things that men were licensed to do with impunity. It was not fair, it had never been fair, and would probably never be fair in the future. End quote. Women's traditional sense of shame as unchastity was also closely bound up with marriageability and the social proscription of illegitimacy. Um, Claire Wills writes, a woman's honor, most clearly signaled by her virginity, was not her own. It was crucial to middle-class marriageability in a system in which women's sexual virtue acts as a guarantee of the legitimacy of social reproduction, end quote. That is, the woman's body belonged exclusively to her husband and guaranteed that he really was the father of the children he, she produced. Conversely, for men, dignity has always stemmed from avoiding ignominia through strength, manliness, power, and even producing sons rather than daughters. Thus, Psalm 126. Sons are a gift from Yahweh. The fruit of the womb is a reward. The sons of one's youth are like arrows in the hand of the hero. Happy is that man who has filled his quiver with them. There will be no shame for them when they debate with their enemies at the city gate. Thus, when I was growing up in family, school, community associations, etc., I was sometimes told to be a man. However, I never heard anybody uh, tell my sister, uh, be a woman. For her, apparently, uh, nature was destiny. Language reflects this difference in words like virility, virile, and virtue that are all based on the Latin vir, man. There is at least one example of shame by association that does not present itself as a social construct. It consists in cases in which a sense of shame exercises a protective function, and not just in the context of sexual mores, but it's also true in war. From Plato's Symposium on, um, <clears throat> what soldiers primarily feared uh, was not being able to stand up in battle, to be courageous, to let down their fellow soldiers. Uh, and there's a very good book on this subject, along with uh, subjects like PTSD. Um, Nancy Sherman's um, The Untold War, Inside the Hearts, Minds, and Souls of Our Soldiers. Uh, she's a professor of philosophy at Georgetown University. And she's done a lot of interviewing uh, with wounded vets. Veterans Hospitals, the 
one thing that they feared above all uh, was letting down their fellow set in battle. Okay. Soldiers, uh, like other members of collectives, can feel both honor and dishonor through collectors' successes and failures. As with Tolstoy's example of the Russian people in War and Peace, uh, feeling shame at the news of their retreating army. So also for Americans, when they learned that their government authorized torture and placed the children of illegal immigrants in cages apart from their parents, uh, basically kidnapping them. However, Americans should have felt shame, though clearly not all did. Yet a sense of shame cannot always exercise a protective effect in war or peace, uh, for sometimes honor conflicts uh, conflicts with virtue and shame can result from whichever set of values uh, prevails. This happens in um, honor cultures. Uh, Sherman talks about traditional Corsican culture and some tribes in the Amazon, uh, where if you don't respond to slights or um, smeared reputations or such like, um, you're ashamed and um, you lose all claim to be a protector of the society, your manhood is defaced, your wives become easy prey for the sexual interests of other men, etc. Related to this, Shakespeare has Hamlet paralyzed because he's hamstrung between two different kinds of shame. Worldly shame requires him to honor his ghostly father's request to kill his uncle, while religious shame equally demands that he not do so. And besides that dilemma, he's both ashamed of his mother and ashamed for his father. And if that were not bad enough, He's also ashamed of his own cowardice while Fortinbras takes 20,000 troops to invade Poland and Shakespeare writes, to go to their graves like dead. Okay. Section two, types of collectors. In our relationships with others in general, there is what Merleau-Ponty terms an essential encroachment or overlapping on Piedmont, a flesh that creates an intercorporeity. Uh, during our uh, COVID-19, uh, lockdowns, uh, we gained a sharper awareness of that overlapping in terms of our breath. Uh, we became sharply aware of how the breath uh, spreads and how it can even make you sick uh, several feet away, be breathed on by somebody. As Ruth Lays observes with respect to freedom, it's not an experience of an individual as a pre-existing self-identical autonomous subject. Rather, there is an unconscious identification with or an incorporative binding to the other that occurs prior to the distinction between ego and its objects. Merleau-Ponty's own description of Place's um, intercorporative binding uh, center primarily on perception, touching, and linguistic expression. He would have approved of Wittgenstein's question, do you look into yourself in order to <coughs> recognize the fury in his face? As Schultz wrote in uh, The Phenomenology of the Social World, the other's body is, quote, no mere physical object uh, like a stone, but a field of expression for the life experience of that psychophysical unity we call the other self, end quote. A clear example of incorporative binding within associations consists of the functioning of a musical group, such as a band, a quartet, or an orchestra that we've heard about today. The members are not fungible. They listen to each other. They know what will be played and how it's supposed to sound. They make up an ensemble of interconnected performers. It's a question of uh, what Schultz calls a mutual tuning in relationship upon which alone all communication is founded. That's Schultz's language. He also sees the mutual tuning in relationship as the foundation for all communication even, he writes, Sartre's basic concept of looking at the other and being looked at by the other, end quote. Um, Zahavi's observation is instructive. What we find in Schutz and in the phenomenological tradition that he is a part of is not only quite sophisticated analyses of intentionality, self, uh, and intersubjectivity, but also a targeted investigation of we intentionality and its contributions to the constitution of social reality, end quote. 
minded bodies and intercorporeity that make possible a we intentionality, such as shirts as mutual tuning in relationships, are two internally related aspects of what Merleau-Ponty calls the interworld. This is why shameful acts, social institutions, and practices and laws can do so much damage. The social fabric really is one. And we have seen in horrifying abundance, as we've seen in horrifying abundance, easily torn apart by racial hatred and discrimination, conspiracy theories, the spread of baseless claims of electoral fraud, uh, the January 6, 2021 insurrection at the US uh, Capitol, and the shameful refusal of the um, medically and religiously eligible to wear masks and be vaccinated against the COVID-19 virus and its very contagious variants. It's deeply shameful that those protesting max mandates back in the beginning of when infection was widely spread in this very city that were photographed um, carrying signs that said, my body, my choice, stop the tyranny with no acknowledgement or even recognition of social duties to avoid spreading infection to others. Asian societies tend to be much better than ours, actually, in fulfilling this minimum obligation. In various forms of association within social reality, the agent must have some meaningful identification, some personal investment, in order for them to be shamed by the mere fact of belonging to it. Such a meaningful connection, in other words, must transcend random forms of social order. Thus, the actions of fellow subway passengers or those of a chance assemblage of patients in a hospital waiting room cannot shame us just because we are also part of that social nexus. There must be some common property that implicates our identities so as to be part of the association. The associations can be large groups or even one person, such as a close relative, and I will use the term collective uh, to apply loosely to all such groupings. In general, shame by association can occur when a collective's actions, inactions, institutions, norms, and social policies, their traditions, and history shame individual members. Inversely, there are decisions, actions, and inactions through which individuals can shape associations, collectives. Many types of relationships are possible in the interactions of individuals and collectives. The structures of these relationships get revealed, among other ways, through language, especially through the possessive adjectives, my, our, and your. Therefore, a fruitful way to gain insight into the modes of associative shame will be through a description of what possession gets expressed in the case of these adjectives. So, I've uh, gathered here four types of associations for your consideration um, that shame can impact. First, there are self-reflective relationships and lifestyle choices of material possessions and food. For instance, my car, my clothes, my dietary choices. These relationships appear as shameful when they are perceived as violative of social rules or when the social values that they embody are judged to be deficient. For example, being carelessly wasteful uh, when recycling is possible. It's also true that possessions can possess us, but only with our compliant dependency rather than rather like the master-slave dialectic. Linguistic evidence for these dependency relationships presents itself in expressions such as, I couldn't get along without my, I can't live without my, and the latest must-have product. Particular objects that we dependently embrace cannot shame us, but we can feel ashamed because of such dependency. Perhaps the first, and certainly one of the most powerful media productions to focus on shame and dietary choices, consisted of something that happened, I think, well before almost all of you were born. I'm really old. Um, this happened in 1960. Edward R. Murrow produced a famous documentary titled Harvest of Shame. On the one hand, it sought to raise Americans' awareness of the systemic exploitation of migrant farm workers by recounting workers' lamentable working and living conditions, their meager pay, and their employers' indifference. One farmer stated, I'll never forget this, we used to imprison our slaves, now we just rent them. Well, the, 
program sought to underscore the social ignorance of and indifference to the shameful exploitation. It also attempted to motivate viewers to prod the government to provide a remedy. For in fact, that actually is what happened. Or as um, Jenny Erpenbeck points out, uh, there are many ways to lose what we generally refer to as innocence. But all of these discoveries have one thing in common. We suddenly begin to read the past differently, end quote. And that's from her book, uh, not a novel, a memoir of pieces, was published as Connie Wilma and the text of a Um I would later like to ask our other German guests if they know Urban Beck's works because I've just discovered them. I think she's quite a good writer. Okay, back to business. The program under, sought to underscore the social ignorance of or indifference to the shameful exploitation. Okay. As such, the documentary can be viewed both as an attempt to get individual citizens to shame the government into action and to motivate the government to mobilize various engines of social persuasion to change consumers' behavior. Hence, the broadcast date, the day after Thanksgiving, was chosen deliberately <clears throat> excuse me, to show people that in their holiday meals they have not only benefited from the migrants' uh, exploitation, but also inescapably a part of it. The program did not attempt to shame consumers because it was premised on the belief that most viewers were unaware of the uh, exploitation on display. What was true of them is what George, George Bernard Shaw said of Shakespeare's characters. They were beings in the air without public responsibilities of any kind. All Shakespeare's characters are so. That's why they seem natural to our middle classes who are comfortable and irresponsible at other people's expense and are neither ashamed of that condition nor even conscious of it." End quote. That's a harsh judgment, but it does point the way to a constructive sense of shame derived from increasing people's knowledge of uh, shameful exploitation. Second type of this, uh, associative relationships. Uh, similar commitments and responsibilities inhere in intimate relationships of family life. My spouse, my child or children, my aged grandmother, etc. Furthermore, collectives have uh, vertical uh, dimensions. A temporal thickness that can reach into the different past of my, uh, excuse me, distant past of my ancestors and protestively to my descendants. Good and bad deeds can trail me like a shadow in my own consciousness and perhaps in those of others as well. Although the experience of shame in such cases tends to be correlated with distance. So it would cause me an enormous amount of shame if I discovered that, uh, let's say, my grandfather or my grandparents were uh, secretly members of the Ku Klux Klan or some other racist organization. Uh, but if they, if I'm talking about discovering some scoundrel 10 or 12 generations ago, I can just sort of mentally put them away you know, as creatures of their lamentable times. Right? But it's no surprise that some children of very high-ranking Nazis uh, had themselves sterilized in order to make sure that the evil could not be, their evil could not be uh, transmitted to future generations. Third, uh, third type of associated relationship. Wider social obligations, for example, those that express commitments to the environment, to the familiar biblical trio of the widow, the stranger, and the orphan, uh, who become my responsibilities and objects of care, as Levinas uh, illustrated, and to other animals uh, that should keep us from purchasing the produce of cruelty on family farms. Um, historical footnote, in Missouri, you might not be able to discover that because our um, legislature passed a law which critics call ag-gag laws, which criminalize uh, people going on factory farms and taking pictures of animals that are treated, treated very cruelly. You can actually get put in prison for doing that, exposing the truth. I'm not making this up. Likewise, today, no defense based on innocent ignorance is available for the many ways in which we negligently contribute to destructive climate change that affects everyone. We know too much. That's also an example of the first kind of associative relationship. To the degree that a subject realizes the truth of destructive climate change and persists in, say, 
in purchasing a huge gas guzzling SUV just to drive to the local mall. A gap or fissure should open up between the agent's self-consciousness and commercial desires. When shame is possible, the self stands accused. The usually unproblematic relationship between purchaser and product is disrupted insofar as the shamed agent is not only involved, but also implicated in the product uh, chosen and to some degree identified with it. Fourth and finally, a kind of possessive relation, uh, associative relationship. Possession, uh, possessive such as, uh, or collectives I should say, but my state or my country refer to memberships in widening concentric circles of collectives. Such relationships may be inflected with bonds of affection and loyalty, but they need not be. Conflicts and disputes about the appropriateness of shame can also manifest themselves in complex community relationships. The phrase, my community, uh, can truly be said of more than one community at the same time, and these can have conflicting values and goals. A national shame infects consciousness differently. It implicates one's identity as stained by past and present social forces beyond one's own control. It exposes the agent to external criticism irrespective of his or her values. For example, most Americans were deeply shamed by the revelations of abuse at Abu Ghraib, the CIA secret prison network, and by the practice of extraordinary rendition. As J.M. Coetzee, remarked at the time, uh, the issue for individual Americans becomes a moral one, he said. How in the face of this shame to which I am subjected do I behave? How do I save my honor? End quote. Consider also <clears throat> the abysmal failure of the U.S. government The abysmal failure of the U.S. government to respond effectively to the damage wrought by Hurricane Katrina on August 29th of 2005 <clears throat> in New Orleans and surrounding parishes, uh, a note for our foreign guests, <clears throat> in every state but Louisiana, um, political subdivisions are called counties. Uh, in Louisiana, derived from French law, they're called parishes, but they're not parishes in a religious sense, they're just an organization government organization. So, <clears throat> in fact, the response of the federal government was so flawed that one parish official uh, was, was stupefied to see a contingent of Royal Canadian Mounted Police on its doorstep before any help from Washington got there. As one reporter summarized the national trauma, <clears throat> perhaps most of all there was shame, a deep collective national belief that the world's sole remaining superpower could not, or at least had not, responded faster and more forcefully to a disaster, which had been among its own government's worst case possibilities for years, end quote. <clears throat> for those who knew history, this massive failure gave rise to a double shame in contrast with better actors 99 years earlier. The very day after the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, the very day after, William Howard Taft, then Secretary of War under President Theodore Roosevelt, had relief trains headed over the Rocky Mountains to the Bay Area to help out. And the same day, Congress passed an emergency enabling resolution to provide money. Um, 200,000 rations were dispatched immediately from Army bases, and over the next two days, a number of Army bases sent uh, trains loaded with equipment uh, to repair the damage. Okay. At the widest concentric circle of associative relationships, um, but you all may not want to call this an association, um, Shakespeare had Hamlet feel a keen sense of shame belonging to our entire species because the pollution was perfectly general and his alienation was therefore complete. His well-known soliloquy uh, expresses the general pollution this way, in Act One. Oh God, oh God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Act Two follows up 
this expression of disgust with equally well-known dramatic contrast. What a piece of work this man amends. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculties, in form and moving, how express and admirable. In action, how like an angel. In apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. And yet, to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Unquote. Another um, and different um, example of this fourth mode of associative shame uh, consists of cultural customs and traditions. Uh, for example, for example um, in the last decade of the 19th century, one Kong Yue, one of the literati advising the Chinese emperor, compared China unfavorably to other nations because of their practice of binding girls and women's feet. He said, um, the Chinese have been stigmatized as barbarians and have become a laughing stock for the rest of the world. Therefore, he felt sick at heart. Kong, as well as other Chinese who felt ashamed of foot binding, need not have felt any sympathy for uh, or shame on account of the perpetrators. Whether they did or did not is contingently true. Rather, a national shame infects consciousness differently. Regardless of whether or not one has done anything or believed anything relevant to the matter at hand, national shame implicates one's identity as stained by past and present social forces beyond one's control and exposes the agent to external criticism. Americans traveling abroad during the George W. Bush and Donald J. Trump administrations are very familiar with this phenomenon. Uh, for instance, uh, shortly after Bush invaded Iraq, my wife was reading a paper at a conference in Dublin, and one evening the organizers took the participants to a pub, and it was not hard to spot the Americans. And one man grabbed my wife, shoved her up against a wall, and got in her face, and demanded to know what she thought of Bush's invasion of Iraq. When she said she disapproved, he let her go. So. Um, anyway, in the eyes of foreigners, the agent is subsumed in what George Herbert Mead called the generalized other, which is the organized community or social group which views the individual as unity of self. The attitude of the generalized other is the attitude of the whole community, Mead wrote. For Mead, as for Merleau Ponty, who as far as I can determine did not know Mead's works, a particular member of society does not become a self-conscious individual first and then enter into bodily intercorporeal relationships with others. <laughs> Rather, uh, to be self-conscious is essentially to become an object to oneself in virtue of one's social relations with other individuals. And hence, the origin and foundations of the self, like those of thinking, are social in form. And you will be delighted to know that I'm on the last page. Thus, as Schutz pointed out, the generalized other may take the structure of an individual, a type, a collectivity, or an anonymous audience or problem. Quote. It must also be said that what shame one feels and the strength of the feeling depend in large part on one's position in the collective, uh, one's position, power, and influence. Uh, private individuals far removed from the centers of power and influence usually feel less shame of than those at the source causing the shame, but not always. I think when um, the information about Abu Ghraib um, and the CIA uh, prisons uh, leaked out, I, I think that the shame was generalized throughout the whole society except for the perpetrators. Um, I don't think distance mattered in that case. Okay, so. Though far from complete, these reflections have attempted to shed some light on the nature and functions of shame in different types of associative relationships and to solicit your own insights on these complex aspects of our life world. To your own responses, I now look forward and thank you for your kind attention. Wilson, and let me see if I can just kind of get the discussion started. So, uh, as you were talking, I was reminded of Herschel Walker, 
And uh, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't remind me of him, but, but I, I was thinking about him because I just read that story about how it is that he got all that money for his campaign. But he does not seem to have the conceptual framework to even begin to frame the issue of shame. Like, maybe I should be ashamed for keeping that extra $7 million. So there's some kind of an issue there that's like a conceptual issue, right? That there's shame. I mean, there's so much that you said that was so rich, but there's this really shallow level in American culture of people empathizing with someone who has no conceptual understanding of or ability to feel shame and it's like let's just make Herschel Walker our poster child. I suppose this is another reason for um, shamelessness, the inability to appreciate what it is. Um, Merle Ponty said one time that you can't talk to what doesn't have ears. So there has to be some ability to respond. The, the question in terms of, of improving society is how you overcome that um, deficit. How you get, how can you appeal to people? Or think about how do we want them to change? Right? Let's be pragmatic here. We don't want people like Herschel or anybody else um, to be unable to appreciate some basic social obligations and be able to contribute to uh, a more peaceful, harmonious society. So how do we do that? Um, but we can show them the destructive effects of not doing it. We can appeal to their self-interest, which is probably the more powerful motive, show how they really benefit um, from um, appreciating um, constructive shame. You know, I had to cut out a lot of this paper because of time constraints and your endurance. But, um, but I also wanted to get on to how a, shame, a sense of shame can be constructive. Um, my hope is that there can, there's a thin hope that by encouraging the development of shame as pure one, uh, we can reach a more harmonious, uh, respectful society, okay? um, where we recognize obligations to other people. So I didn't get it all into the, into the ways that shame could be constructive. But I do think that we have to first get people to recognize that there are boundaries that we should not transgress, and that it's wrong to transgress other people's boundaries and violate their autonomies and take advantage of them for fun and profit. And um, I, I really held back on my relation, uh, remarks about Trump, <laughs> the Republican Party, people like Marshall, et cetera. I didn't want this to turn into a rant. And, and that's been a danger for me in writing this book. I mean, I had to control myself to keep it as a work of philosophy, not a newspaper column. Do you want to push that some more? Sorry. Next question for Yes. Please. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask about a question you uh, posted on the distinction between uh, shame and embarrassment. Uh, embarrassment. It seems like embarrassment uh, can only be as a reaction, it has to do with ridiculous, like having done something which is ridiculous. Whereas shame can be previous to action. And I think that this is an important distinction between embarrassment and, and shame. On the other side of you, uh, it focuses on the linguistic distinctions. I would like to recall that ignominia is a very strong conception. Also, the word vergüenza, which is also for shame, and we can talk about national shame as vergüenza nacional. But uh, vergüenza, uh, it can also be something more simple, like being introverted or don't have the courage to do something. So I think that ignominy is a very, very strong word, and I wonder if shame also has this ambivalence that it can refer to this strong ignominy when one has to lose every kind of dignity and values, but also the sense of being introvert or don't want to do things wrong. Right. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. <clears throat> Those are important points. First off, um, ignomedia is a strong word, and certainly in, in the ears of, uh, let's say, English speakers, I mean, nominee is, you know, like a destroyed reputation or something. And uh, frankly, I wish there were um, a Latin word that would have been milder, but I couldn't find one. Uh, 
Um, if you got one, I'd be happy to use it. Uh, second, uh, does the name Gabrielle Taylor mean anything to you? She wrote an interesting book. She's an Oxford philosopher. She wrote an interesting book published in uh, 1985 called Pride, Shame, and Guilt. And one way that she distinguishes between um, shame and embarrassment is in terms of the weight of the experience. Uh, she describes shame as something much more serious. Uh, shattering is her word uh, that she uses. Her problem, though, is that she doesn't distinguish between various degrees of shame. Uh, you can be ashamed, you can be a sort of, you know, really powerfully, and then you feel like you are destroyed. But there are also lesser degrees of that. You can feel half ashamed of something, etc. Um, one argument that won't work uh, to distinguish shame from embarrassment is just that very thing, actually, because um, Nietzsche is a, is a good person to speak to this. You know, um, when, when something trivial happens or comparatively trivial happens, it causes me embarrassment. It's easy for me not to see that serious or shattering because I, my, I can repress it. The subject matter is not as heavy or as serious. Right? Um, and, but Sartre, I think, is correct. We are totalities. Everything reveals itself about us. And if I drop this mic, I'll be embarrassed. I might not be ashamed, but I reveal myself to you and to myself as the kind of person who is clumsy enough to drop it. But we all have vested interests, I think, in not knowing ourselves. In somewhere, somewhere Nietzsche uh, talks about how the, uh, the uh, Delphic Oracle's uh, uh, maximum, know thyself, uh, was actually malicious. Uh, we, we would talk about how you know, self-knowledge is usually bad news, and there's a lot of, you know, about me, I don't want to, you know, express. In fact, writing this book on shame has been a struggle more difficult than you might imagine because uh, consulting my own experiences, there's a lot that I don't want to see. There's a lot that's been dredged up, memories that are long since buried, and buried because they had to be repressed so I could just get on with life. So you can distinguish shame from embarrassment in terms of either the objective results of the action or inaction, or in terms of your feelings, but I think for Nietzsche, the reasons Nietzsche gives us, appealing to how you perceive it is not a very good basis for distinguishing. It might better rest on the objective consequences of the action. But that's only the beginning of an answer. Next questions are over here. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, I was prompted by talk firstly to go to two reflective kind of comments, but that leads to a question. Uh, firstly, the affirmation in the sense of shame has been from the other in a certain way, whether it's an omnipotent deity that looks at me, uh, the other in the comments that speak to me, or the other within myself in the sense that I look at myself and, and, and see uh, sort of shame is from the other in a certain sense, which prompts me then to think just as you went to the linguistic and the ethnological Clusters of words pertaining to shame. Shame translates to scandal, which is scandal, um, but it also relates to scandal, which is the sense of being naked, the sense of being exposed, and for one to be the scand is to be naked, is to be exposed. And from there, then, I was so, so, it was so wonderful that you went to the gendered nature of it because. The word scandal is also a colloquial term for a woman's vagina. So to the extent that, and we spoke about this, I won't reiterate it, but I thought then, can we think, and how is it possible to think shame in terms of the secret? And I'm thinking perhaps of Derrida here too, but to the extent that shame is the is exposing that which needs to be hidden, that of which I am capable of, perhaps, that of being repressed in a psychological or psychoanalytic sense, 
is there a way to think shame then in relation to associated to or in some way uh, theorized alongside the secret? That's complex. For one thing, we should be very generous and we get these two words that are nothing close to mind. One is nude and the other is naked. Painters and sculptors create nudes, but they don't create nakeds. The word naked conveys a sense of being exposed and typically against one's will. So it's called the expression of being caught naked. You know, someone catches you out and you're all together. And so shame is associated with that rather than just being nude. On the other hand, different valuations can take place here. Nietzsche inverts it completely, and he said, well, he has nothing but contempt for the poor, weak European people who, you know, have to have this masquerade of wearing clothes and just disguising their profound weakness, et cetera. Um, so um, I'm not sure this answers your question, but um, nakedness is typically associated with a shameful state as opposed to simply nudity. Um, no, yeah, I mean, I was just thinking in terms of that how it relates to the, the, the secret or thinking the secret of that which needs to be repressed and is now exposed, or that which we are capable of and which we have now exposed ourselves as, you know, yeah, well, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm still struggling with it, and I'm, I'm, that was, I'm just trying to think it through, and hopefully with, with your help. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of thoughts. One, I like the way that you use language um, to say, you, know, you just did it, um, I caught naked, right? You, you did phenomenology through language, and it reminds me of uh, kind of the way J.L. Austin worked, who sometimes called his work linguistic phenomenology. Um, and so I like that. I like that that's a good way to do phenomenology. Um, also, you know, so, mistakes and I mean I, I know it I know it um, I, I, I haven't read it but I know it I mean I know the, some of the ideas no 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 I Austin's someone I want to I want to read more of the thing I was thinking of is you know um, shame has had some currency in psychoanalytic work um, uh, including um, Heinz Kohut um, who Leslie may know a lot about having done training in Chicago um, you know, and Kohat's idea is that the shame, uh, narcissism is related to shame, right? So on the one hand, you get someone like Herschel Walker, who granted is a kind of piece of work, right? Um, who seems shameless, right? He lies about having a college degree, he lies about you know, paying for girlfriend abortions, right? And, and yet, I think Kohat would say that shamelessness comes out of shame. <laughs> a, sort of, a sort of shame at, um, you know, um, feeling weak, inferior, empty, you know, um, and, and so you go out and you have to say, oh yes, I, I, I not only graduated, but I graduated with honors, right, when you didn't even finish college. You say that because you're, you're, you're ashamed of who you are, and so you have to create this narcissist, you, you know, this, this persona, which other people are going to say, oh, you graduated with honors, that's fantastic, you know. So anyway, I, I think that, you get my point? Yeah, and there are a couple other people who might be able to speak to that too in the room. This is related to um, two senses of innocence. Um, Wittgenstein said that there are two kinds of innocence. One is the innocence with which we start life, that is from childhood. Uh, the other is the innocence that a man is fought for, which is a moral achievement. The question is that is moral to apply to an infant, right? And so, Shamelessness, the learning of proper boundaries and respect for others, etc., uh, comes out of a wide variety of sources, right? And teachings, like school, and public inculturation in general. On the other hand, I don't want to push that too far.
because there is a view that I think is really wrong-headed, namely that we can't learn what is normal and accept it in a piece of behavior, except on the basis of what's abnormal.
make that happen for you. But we shouldn't. Right? Um, on the other hand, we can make a, a, a judgment on the objective state of affairs that what went on in Mar Marlboro uh, is nothing like what uh, Biden is, uh, is uh, And Biden seems to be cooperating fully with the, uh, the Department of Justice about this. So, yeah. Evaluation do come into the assessment of objective safety and fairness. You want to push that? But Biden was careless about those documents. I mean, I, I tend to make, I do, I, I excuse it, right? But, and I agree the, diff the difference is with Trump, but I also think I, I can feel myself being lighter on him, you know, and just saying, well, it's just kind of dumb, you know. But he was careless, you could say he's careless about important pieces of the document, you know. Right. That's not, that's not, he's, at least he's turning it over right away, but, yeah. you see what I mean? I mean, but my relevances are suddenly affecting the typifications and the standards. Yeah. And, and I think that's consistent with what we were talking about earlier. Yeah, right. Next question, right here. I've got a jump start on this as we were talking this afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm going to lead up to a suggestion for the main title of your book. Oh, good. Okay that um, so many of the platonic dialogues are centered on the successful or unsuccessful cultivation of shame. It's unsuccessful with Alcibiades, but he is then seen as the devil of Athens. It's successful with Thrasymachus, who ends up listening to the whole dialogue to the end of the Republic, interested but silent. If you think of nations feeling shame, America felt shame at not helping their victims in the flood of 27 and the flood of 2005, and out of that came Roosevelt, came Obama. If you think of Germany's shame at Hitler, out of that came the most environmentally and refugee suffering state in the modern world. Um, so in my culture of Judaism, there's a famous saying, in the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So I want to suggest for your title, in the feeling of shame, is the beginning of wisdom, if you like that. Or just as a general idea. Yes. No, that, that's a very intriguing suggestion. I mean, wisdom, I think, should be part of the title. Yeah. And certainly, it's something about uh, what we were discussing earlier uh, at lunch about Pride, but the cluster values really could include that. I also would like to give a title that would express both senses of shame. Yeah. Uh, pudor as well as uh, something like egomania, but not that. Just one other, I mean, in some ways, phenomenology is an expression of shame for empiricism. And that well, you, could, you could go from knowledge is power. And Husserl says at the end of the Christ, no, in the Vienna lecture, he said, out of the ashes of what we have called civilization, but was not really civilized, can emerge the phoenix of a new humanity. So you could, you could say wisdom is pudeur, but you wouldn't want that as a title. Um, correct. Instead of knowledge is power, wisdom is pudeur. I, I think wisdom is essential for um, socializing pudeur. Yeah. And we don't really talk about wisdom. You know, philosophy means this philosophy of love and wisdom, but people don't talk about wisdom. Uh, wisdom was never mentioned in any course I took as an undergraduate or graduate uh, in philosophy. It was all about knowledge. It's knowledge that was standing. Not any kind of mind. I mean, that's what Sophia um, Okay, the last question that will come from Jerry. I'm Jerry Williams, and uh, my question has to do with temporality. It seems to me that the feeling of either shame or embarrassment, it's about, it's an emotion, it's a feeling about a completed act. But somehow incorporating in that feeling, it's an irrational desire to undo the act already done. Yeah. I just wanted to know what you thought about that. Oh, that's, that's quite right. Um, very good point. Um, and it's certainly easier in terms of embarrassment. Uh, but actually, Taylor, uh, Gabriel Taylor, correlates the feeling of embarrassment uh, with the desire for situational repair. That's the sort of thing that you're talking about here. 
she treats shame as something that's far more devastating, that is not confined to just one uh, situation, but it's something more general and deeper that has to be fixed. Uh, and I think most people most of the time do think that way about embarrassment and shame. But they're border cases. Uh, what do you think of this one? Uh, this was told to me by a Catholic priest. Um, he was in a wedding reception, and one of the guests spilled red wine on the bride's dress. Now, in, in terms of embarrassment um, or shame, I think the borderline there is very flexible. Um, I mean, that's going to reverberate in the guy's consciousness that he had one for a long time. And so, it certainly was embarrassed. Everybody was embarrassed. The bride was furious and devastated, he said. Um, but it's it's shameful that he was so clumsy and took that risk unwarrantedly. Right? But there are lots of situations in life that aren't like that. You know, I can be embarrassed by how long I ran the room, you know, <laughs> necessary time, and I don't some shame. Maybe I should. Okay, let's thank our keynote. Is uh, for. <laughs>